Thank you, Dean. So, for occasions like this, I bring a little jar of grease in my pocket that I rub on my ears to get my head back out the door. Um, but thank you for the introduction. Um, the, the dean is correct. What I do is a team sport. I mean, there ain't nobody that good. And the bottom line is, you know, I've been incredibly fortunate to have just an astonishing group of collaborators. And uh, I, I could tell you some rather amusing stories about, you know, doing stuff that was just slightly out of bounds for IBM. But one of the funny things about IBM is there's a book that was written, it was published in Harvard Business School called Radical Collaboration, a Radical Innovation. And oddly enough, it was about what we do. And you know, you don't generally work for a company with 440,000 people and $100 billion of revenue operating in about 190 countries and talk about radical. However, um, there is a core of technologists in the company, a fairly large core, who do some fairly amazing things. And I'll, I'll give you a sense for not just what we do, because you know a lot of history, but how we do it, some of the impacts, how you sort of drive innovation, some of the new trends that are coming, and try at each step to point out why it's absolutely vital that you remain current. One of the saddest things is if you lose track of you know, the laws of physics, the funny thing is you get burned by them, because believe it or not, the laws of physics are pretty much the same on both coasts of the United States. So no matter where you go, you know, you're not, you're not, how do I put this? You don't get off the hook because you work in Silicon Valley or you work in Hudson Valley. Either way, they matter. And the funny thing is, periodically, people forget. I mean, they do stuff that just boggles the mind, um, not to mention makes a really financial mess of their companies. Um, like I said, the fundamentals that you're going to get here are really just a funny, basically, the biggest thing you come away with is, is like a little bell. And that bell should start ringing really loudly when you hear somebody saying things to you that just don't compute because they just violate some fundamental tenet that you've been trained on. Listen to the bell. Take my word. You know, the standard joke is if you're standing in a tunnel, there's a light at the other end, but the light is going side to side and there's noises like choo-choo, step the hell out of the way. It's a train. It's not the light at the end of the tunnel. You know, don't ignore the obvious, because sometimes you get run over by it. And I, I watch as great companies get run over by these trains, which you could see coming literally miles away. And you go, what the? And the problem is they sort of fell in love with their technology and forgot that it had roots in science. So without further ado, you know, I talk about innovation. What's the big deal? Well, before, about 2007, right, before it per per <coughs> proverbially hit the fan, um, the ability to innovate was actually already valued very, very highly by most CEOs, CIOs, senior executives. And they said, yeah, 54% of them said it was vital to the growth of their business, vital to survival. That looks great. A funny thing happened in 2010, after it hit the fan, suddenly 84% found that innovation is vital. You know why? It's not that the numerator got bigger, but the denominator got a hell of a lot smaller. <clears throat> the guys who, where are the mathematicians in the room? Jeez. Got to Physicists, you know, you guys at least can add and divide. Come on. Um, the bottom line is, all of a sudden, the guys who weren't innovating disappeared. You know, the ones who are on top, no problem. It, it actually is the truth, and it's really kind of scary. After every major economic downturn, the folks who are there are the folks who continue to innovate through it. The ones who disappear are the ones who just stop and say, well, you know, we'll just uh, kill off the innovation. It doesn't pay off short term. We'll just start it again when we're done. Yeah. It, Here's the deal about innovation. It's an engine. It takes about 30 years to start and about three minutes to kill. Just remember that before you turn the key off. Um, I report one step from our chairman of the board. This is part of the reason I, I refuse to give up this spot is anybody who reaches for the key, I break their fingers. Okay, it's, it's serious. I mean, it's part of our culture. Our culture has valued this forever. The day we lose it is the day we're dead. <laughs> the good news is, and it's, it's not just one piece of science and one piece of engineering. You can't fall in love with your project. Well, you can. That's a fatal disease. You know, you, you have to be data-driven. But the fact of the matter is innovation is core to the companies that reinvent themselves and the ones who fail to reinvent themselves, they're not with us anymore. Now, there are many different types of innovators, but the ones we look for share two basic properties. Um, they have tremendous depth. I mean, they are really bright, and there's got to be a field that you should be able to take on anyone and hold your own in a minimus, beat them preferably. But you also have to have the ability to work in a team-oriented project, communicate with your peers, because if you're just this little, you know, delta, if you're this little delta function spike, right, you're infinitely deep and no width, you basically are useless. 
because you can't communicate with your peers, you can't share your ideas, and you can't learn from them. That's not a value. Putting it another way, you, what you do is you want a nerd with a personality. Um, now, they're, they come in different flavors. You know, innovators, they're not all of one type. In fact, there are two distinct class of innovators. You have the aha innovators. These are the folks who periodically go, aha. And you know, they're pretty big ahas, and we've had our collection of them that go way back. Um, I, I always enjoy pointing out a colleague of mine, Bob Denard. By the way, Bob is still bald. Um, Bob still comes to work. Bob actually works full time. That was 1966 when he walked in his office and he actually wrote down the one device memory cell. Anybody here ever hear of DRAM, right? One guy. By the way, he's got a pile of metals that on this desk would come up about that high. He also, by the way, figured out how to solve one of the conundrums of Moore's Law, which I'll get to in a minute. Well, I can do it now. Moore's Law, by the way, if you read the original paper, says nothing about anything other than the fact you're going to double roughly every 18 months what's on a chip. Doesn't deal with the other issues because that in and of itself was an incredible insight. Gordon is quite the genius, to be blunt. Not a lot of people get things right that span four decades and you know, six orders of magnitude. That's pretty damn good. But there was another side to that. You do realize that if you followed Moore's law and you did nothing about the power of the devices and you doubled them every six, you know, 18 months, what would happen is eventually you would have a chip that had a million times as much stuff on it as you started with in the beginning. Okay. Except that means if you had a 10 watt chip and hadn't done anything about the power of discrete devices, you'd now have a 10 megawatt chip which in your laptop would provide you with a brief but incredibly exciting experience when you turned it on. <laughs> um, that Bob solved. Bob wrote the laws of classical scaling, which is what you do is you follow a recipe, you make the device smaller, and by changing, the spec, changing all the sizes within the device, I don't want to go through the, crawl through the detail, Basically, it's a recipe of how you make the device half the size and it burns exactly half the power. So you have 10 watt, 10 watt, 10 watt forever, which is really pretty damn clever. Bob is a fairly bright guy and he still contributes. And the aha moment was shared among many people. We've invested the disk drive back in 56. Uh, Ramac, uh, where is it? That's up there on the left. It's the third from the uh, left. These are big things. Okay, but there are the other type of innovators. and there's. I, I bristle when people make fun of these folks. They come to work every day and they make things 10% better. They just say, wow, you know, I realize there's this little thing I can do that'll improve things 5, 10%. Oh, that doesn't matter, right? Okay. The guys who do this, the people who do this work, let's say hypothetically we didn't have any of them. So we invented the disk drive in 56 and we decided, okay, you know, we got a disk drive. We're done. Let's move on. Today, anybody got a notion of what your laptop would weigh if we hadn't done that? We've got a laptop up front. What do you think the laptop sitting there or this would weigh? Okay, let's try this. 100 pounds? How about 1,000 pounds? Okay, 10 tons. There you go. I was going to say it's a little bidding. How about 100 tons? Okay, well, it would actually weigh a quarter of a million tons. Okay, do not make fun of the, you know, continuous innovators. <laughs> They're pretty damn important. You see, what happens is, originally, a laptop or any other top, <clears throat> the actual spinning disks that we had were roughly one ton per megabit. Do the math. Mm. You probably wanted to improve on that. These folks are vital. So you want several different types of innovators. The other thing is you need an infrastructure to innovate. And basically, we started out with core labs. In fact, we put in our most recent two in Nairobi and Brazil, Sao Paulo, Brazil specifically. <laughs> but then we said, you know, a lot of smart people in the world. So we set up what we call collaboratories. A collaboratory is where you take a focused group on a focused problem, and that focused group on this focused problem may only have 20 IBMers, 20 people from a university, maybe 20 from a government. And that collaboratory just collaborates on that topic. And there's some really kind of cool things you learn. In the uh, Ireland, the Galway Bay. Galway Bay is a major source of revenue for the nation because they have, of course, fishing, recreation, tourism, you name it. They also have a water quality issue. Now, there are two ways of chasing that. You either develop these incredibly sophisticated buoys with chemical sensing, and I mean, it's really, they're extraordinarily expensive. They're half a million bucks, they float around. And you have to put a bunch of them out there because every time a ship goes by, you want to be able to have a water sensor that basically says, okay, this sensor says something is in the water. Then the ship is going and the next sensor says something's in the water and you can track it back to 
where the source of the problem is, but this is huge expense. Unless you work with a biologist. The biologist says, what are you kidding? I mean, and he comes up with a much better sensor called a mollusk. Seriously, clam. What does a clam do? Well, let's see if there's anything in the water, even at the part per billion level, you know what it does? So you put this little chip that senses if the clams are open or closed, and you put just hang bags of sensing clams all over the place, and as the ship goes by, when the clams close, you go arrest the captain of the passing ship for throwing junk in the water. It's fantastic. Clams work cheap, by the way, and they live about 40 years. The batteries don't last that long, so the you know, clam outlasts the sensor. The point is, you, you really think we would have come up with this? You've got you to be kidding, right? I mean, we're just not that good. That's why you go and work with other people. Diversity is a huge value. You have no idea the stuff we've learned from working with others. The other thing is evolution, and it's a huge change. You know, when I came to IBM, we were a centrally funded lab, mostly funded by corporate. Nowadays, it's just a global collaboration. It's extraordinarily open. You know, somewhere in the middle of this, we got religion about, for instance, Linux, and we basically championed the open source movement, which would have been inconceivable 20, 30 years earlier, or would have been unemployable <coughs> back then. Lots have changed. Now, here's an interesting observation. People went to the moon, right? You, not, most of you wouldn't know. I actually watched this, in, not in person, mind you, but nonetheless, I did watch the lunar landing, and it hadn't dawned on me then that we did this with, by the way, 2K. K, kilo, thousand, you know, I, I know I have to explain that to you guys who are thinking gig, but um, K of memory. You had 2,000 words of RAM. That was the whole thing. Do you really think that you could get a ship to and from the moon on 2K? And the answer is, damn right you can. We did. We ran all the IT for that project, and it worked. Now, what blows my mind is the average smartphone is 64 gig nowadays and going up. So you've got 10, 20 million times the capacity sitting in your pocket for texting Shakespeare in 140 words or less, 140 characters or less. Meanwhile, we got to the moon on 2,000 words. Um, there is a point to be made here. We've come a long way. After 50 years, uh, we've come an incredibly long way. So you have to, you know, you're an innovator. Start asking yourself questions. Um, relevant question. How many times can you fold a piece of paper eight and a half by 11 and a half? Anybody here know? Hmm? Bingo. Yeah, about eight times. This is actually great because what you do is you go down to the local bar where the football team hangs out, and if they're not football scholars, which by the way, some of them are, so watch out for them, but the ones who are not, you know, you bet them 100 bucks, you can't fold it in half 10 times because they're a sissy. Then you make sure you get the money and you're basically between them and the door. You don't want it the other way around, it'll end badly. Um, but you understand, I mean, the fact of the matter is, no matter how big you are, you're not getting around it. Well, the same problem comes here, guys. Remember Moore's Law, cut it in half forever? Yeah, that doesn't work. You know why atoms don't scale? They get really unhappy. In fact, when you decide you're going to cut the atoms in half, you let me know because that's fission and I'm out of here. There's a problem. This is what happened in the past. This is the whole technology, whatever. During a generation of technology development, you make a couple of improvements, you know, those are little steps, and you eventually get maybe 20% more performance out of a device. And by the way, we've been doing that pretty much uninterrupted for about four decades. You know the problem with that? you get really sloppy. So what happens is, eventually you get to the point that you forget that the laws of physics start to come into play. Ever hear of quantum mechanics? Hmm. There was a time in 2003, the most thankless thing I did was I actually tried to warn one community of folks doing this that um, if you keep cutting things in half, you're going to get to the point that, for instance, the oxide in a transistor become so thin that you start the onset of a quantum mechanical tunneling phenomenon known as Fowler-Nordheim tunneling. The thanks I got for this is a year later, a guy who was sitting in the audience put my face up in front of 5,000 people with a red circle around it, a bar through the thing, and it said, Bernie says Moore's Law ends, because the guy didn't know the difference between Moore's Law and scaling. Um, that, that actually worked out well for me, because I got the next year's um, keynote. So I showed up with a big picture of a turkey with a red circle around it. That's, that went over big, actually. Because you see, this is what happened. Turns out, now if you follow the same, just make it smaller, faster, better, cheaper, none of the above occur. Actually, it gets slower, costs more, and burns up. Oops. In fact, that whole chip line that I was trying to warn these guys about immolated itself, and they spent years recovering. Um, the point is, you can fix all this stuff nowadays, but you would not believe how much money you have to spend to make one transistor. In the current generations, when I started, it was 100000 to maybe a $1 million to come to the next generation of technology, you know, the next shrink. Today, the first transistor costs you $2.3 billion for one transistor. The second transistor is really cheap. 
But man, that first one's a killer. Uh, as a consequence of that, as you may or may not know, there are exactly two companies left in the world at the bleeding edge of this. It's us and Intel, and there ain't anybody else. The difference is we have a very different model, which is we have lots of partners who we work, do this jointly with, Samsung, uh, ST Microelectronics, NEC, Hitachi, um, uh, and on and on and on. I mean, it's actually quite a list. Uh, Intel is very talented, but they do it on their own. I mean, you can have either model, but the fact of the matter is the cost is unimaginable, which is why the first chip that they produce is 1000 bucks, right? It comes down over time, but you have to get the investment back. The trouble is now, this doesn't work anymore. Because for the first time in history, you shrink things, you're actually down where you're approaching a quantum mechanical limit, which is an inconceivable problem. To see how bad it's gotten, this is what the recipe book looked like for silicon technology when I started, and half of your faculty started in this business. That was it. Anything colored in, that's all you found. Somewhere between the 90s and 2005, you know, we got cute. We put new metals in, new silicides. Uh, I did silicon germanium work with a large team that showed up in a few places, like every device in the room. Um, but the fact of the matter is, that was that. Somewhere around the time that you transitioned to this challenge I described, a funny thing happened, and I enjoy showing this, particularly to the fellow who has since, by the way, apologized, bought me huge amounts of beer and written many notes. Um, that's what's in a transistor today. Okay, that's bad karma when you have to use half the periodic table just to make the thing go, you know, transist. This is not actually very funny, and it has actually caused a huge discontinuity in this business where companies where they invented pieces of technology that are precious. You know, the integrated circuit was invented down in the TI. They're no longer doing ad tech. Uh, you've got Bell Labs, there's no more silicon work there. I mean, this has really caused a profound shift in the industry. Now, therefore, if you're not going to get a lot of more glitz out of silicon, and you have no idea how bad it is, I mean, we're sitting at roughly a 22 nanometer generation now, headed to maybe 14. People are already cheating. The next generation should be 14. It'll probably look more like 16. Um, in addition to that, when you get down to about 7 nanometers, which theoretically is three generations from now, you know what happens? Silicon itself goes quantum mechanical. At about a seven nanometer channel, the silicon device is a confinement device, which is a very polite way of saying that if you change the width of the device by one or two atomic widths, the energy required to inject a carrier goes up by uh, 5, 10, 20, 30 millivolts, which is a polite way of saying it's useless. Oops. So silicon technology basically is done after 50 years. Uh, after having said that, by the way, as you'll see, some things don't change, some do. So there are a couple of new things you have to look at. Light. That's roughly what? 300 billion, yeah. Uh, three times 10 to the ninth. Uh, three times 10 to the eighth, so it is 300 billion. I'm going to write. Uh, meters per second, right? Way too slow. God. Um, to give you some idea how pathetically slow that is compared to the speed of current technology, at the frequency we run our transistors today, a beam of light goes about that far in the time it takes for a machine to complete an entire cycle. Oops. Anybody here ever see a data center that was this big? Uh, I hope if you did, by the way, you're, well, never mind. Uh, we we got to talk later. The fact of the matter is, this data centers today, as you know, have this sprawl. Imagine if the machine over there wants to talk to the one over there and share data. Yeah, that works out real well. It's about 1,000 to 10,000 to 100,000 cycles wasted just getting the signal to the other machine so it can go look for the data and send it back. So light is a huge problem. It's way too slow. And no, don't please, somebody don't chirp in, yeah, I know, but CERN's fixed that problem with superluminary, superluminary particles. That didn't actually happen. Um, and so on and so forth. Classical technology is pretty much done. The small knob, keep trying to make things smaller, has broken the bank. Um, EUV, uh, that is the next generation of lithography to make small chips. Anybody have any idea what one of those tools costs? Just one. You buy it by the six pack, by the way. Hmm? $200 million. So when you're building a new silicon fab, eh, no problem, you know, shell out $5 billion. And when your CEO says, will it work? You say, maybe. Haven't built it yet. Fantastic. Uh, this is an exciting business to be in. In spite of all of the challenges, the funny thing is the technology is not going to slow down. Information technology has evolved and it will no longer be about the chip. The days of somebody sleeping out in front of a you know, store waiting for the next 100 megahertz processor so they can be the first person who has one. Those are gone, plus that person really needed to get a life anyway. Um, the era has come to an end. And it is somewhat of a profound statement. After literally, you know, 40, 50 year run, it's done. Yet, going forward for several decades, it will be silicon. 
The difference is the kick won't come from that. The kick is going to come from the integration of hardware, software, systems, network functionality. Basically, it's become an integration problem. And a large part of that is because light is way too slow for this application, which does bring up some very interesting opportunities and challenges. The investment, by the way, is going to drive a huge consolidation of this industry for years to come. If you've seen what happened with TI, same thing with Fujitsu, these guys, all of them ultimately have kind of backed away from the leading edge. So, you know, what do you do? What are the new trends? And that's where it gets kind of interesting because after roughly 50 years of this, you scale the chip down in size and then you scale out to big things, right? You actually have to invert this because that data center on scale out or these massive systems these things do not take advantage of proximity in the sense that if you have to send a signal any distance, basically if you do it electronically, the power required is RC time, is basically huge. It's linear in the distance you're traveling. Well, that tells you something. If you basically want to avoid chip crossings and other things, you're going to have to shrink from literally meters to microns. Well, son of a gun, they might think you do this. There is a thing called chip stack. This has been hypothetical a long time, but it's no longer hypothetical. We actually work closely with 3M, and I'm not talking about taking two chips and packing them one on the other. I'm talking about basically saying, hey, what we're going to do is we're going to basically take these chips and stack literally the entire system. I'm talking about a whole rack into a single chip, and we'll thin them down to about 50 microns. And then you're going to stack 20, 30, 40, 50 chips. So you're talking about a stack that's only literally couple of millimeters high, if that, and it's your entire system. Now this has huge challenges, technological challenges, materials challenges. Just wiring this thing up is not trivial. The architecture is a nightmare. And oh, by the way, if you've got all this power in a single device, how do you cool it? How do you get the energy out? The materials that you use to, quote, glue them together also have to be great thermal conductors or else the thing in the middle melts. I mean, this is an enormous technical challenge, but it is underway. This is a very, very active major program, in fact, and a lot of people are going down this road. There are people, in fact, in the memory area who are already doing this. So that is one of the things you're starting to see, because when you do this, the distance between your memory and your logic shrinks to microns, as opposed to meters or more. So you are taking a factor of a thousand to a million out of the distance you have to send signal, which dramatically decreases the power required just for signaling. In a typical logic device today, I.O. drives about half the power. This isn't trivial. Just input-output drives half the power, and that's been going up with time. The other thing is, and there's some really elegant work going on in optics here, basically you want to integrate the optics on this kind of a stack because bottom line is, electrically, you'll never get enough data off this. You'll be doing CWDM, basically coarse wave division multiplexing to get things off. Literally, you can run it at 10, megabit, 10 gigabits per second or more if you really are good about it. This is all going on, and it works. But this is an entirely new world. This does not resemble the technology that's currently in use today. Yet, if you don't do this, things stop. And they won't stop. I don't want somebody to go away saying, you know, I'm predicting the end. Quite the opposite. They will continue, but it's going to be a very different set of things that we do research on. And fundamentally, the architecture, after years of being scale out, is scale in. And you know, I never thought I'd see it, but the bottom line is there just aren't that many things you can do, one of which is you just make the damn thing smaller and denser. If you go small and you go dense, you actually get a huge benefit in terms of proximity. I mean, it sounds trivial. It's not trivial <laughs> from materials and uh, from every point of view. It's incredibly difficult. But the fact is that is what people have to do. There's a huge amount of innovation. But this is just starting. So. One of the questions we've always asked ourselves is, is there a best practice to drive innovation? Because this is something you're not going to trip over. This isn't going to be one of those aha moments. This is going to be a long grind. And there's a great example of that. And we, got, we had a piece of this. Kennedy was probably the best guy I've ever seen in terms of doing this. What he did was he said something that would have caused any sensible engineer to grab their head and run screaming from the room. You know, back when he announced this, right, 2K of memory. You're going to take a bunch of folks, launch them into orbit. You're going to basically send them to the moon, get them back in one piece. And we did it, and we did it time and again and again and again. I had the incredible honor one evening of um, having dinner with John, Senator John Glenn, uh, completely by accident, by the way. Turns out the good news is the guy to his right was a reporter. Apparently, he doesn't talk to them. And I, he asked, do you fly? I said, yeah. He said, excellent. And we had a great conversation. 
we, we were the after dinner and before dinner speaker at a semi-conference. And one of the things he did, because he actually flew in one of these mercury capsules, is he was explaining to me that, in fact, in his first, he had two concerns. First, and I'm sure you've all heard this by now, when he was launched into orbit at the beginning of this program, he said, they asked him, you know, what's your greatest fear? He says, well, I'm sitting on 10,000 tons of high explosive built by the lowest bidder. <laughs> yeah, that, that definitely resonated. <laughs> this is, uh, okay. By the way, before you all giggle, keep in mind, your car, never mind, same thing. Uh, they have suppliers, guess what? They don't pay them the maximum they'll take. Uh, leaving that aside, um, the fact of the matter is, they actually said to him, well, there's this problem. While he was in orbit, this black sucker is the heat shield. This is your retro rocket, right? They said, we have a little problem. What's that? Well, there's a sensor that indicates the heat shield fell off during takeoff, and it's just dangling. Fantastic. So basically, you know, you, you will immolate yourself on reentry. Have a nice day. Click. Um, he asked if they had any more clever suggestions that, than he, you know, immolate himself, and they said, yeah, well, actually, one of the things you might do is that retro rocket, just don't get rid of it. They said, well, have we ever done that? No, <laughs> but it will hold the heat shield in place. It says, what's the bad news? Well, you know, there will be molten metal streaming past the window as you're coming in, and we're not entirely sure what that'll do. They actually did leave the retro rocket in place during his re-entry, and since I had dinner with him, it obviously worked. But, you know, this was, this was what I call extreme innovation, on the fly, in many ways. We decided not to threaten anyone's life or put them on 10,000 tons of high explosive, but we did say to people, look, you know, grand, grand challenges are a fantastic way of drawing progress. The U.S. space program was just unimaginably productive in terms of what it brought forward to the world. Our, everything from the materials used for artificial aortas to the materials used on frying pans for nonstick. I mean, a, a huge amount of benefits for society. And so we asked people, look, you know who we are. I mean, we're IBM. We're innovation. We are an IT company. What could we do that would really move the needle? And we asked this, by the way, of the entire company. We called it an innovation jam. And a lot of us stayed up for almost seven days straight, which is why I'm still drinking coffee. And um, we basically tried to organize people's thoughts as to what you might attack. And they gave us some interesting problems. And remember, the rule was it has to be a problem associated with data and how you handle it. Some of the issues they came back with is they said there's a global challenge in food. There are millions of tons of food thrown away because basically we have the data that tells us where it's being grown, where it needs to be shipped, what it should be shipped in, and then we do nothing with it. So vast amounts of it just rot. Okay, what if we stop doing that? Somebody realized that if you simply didn't throw away any food in the UK and the US, you could feed one billion people and lift them out of starvation. Okay, these aren't little, little you know, effects. There you go, traffic in Moscow. Um, <clears throat> The interesting thing is the number of cars in the world will double by 2020. This traffic looks pretty much the same in Mexico City. There it's going to quadruple in 2020. My own thought is the only solution is you're going to stack the cars four high and the guy on the bottom just has a bad day. Um, the net of it is this is a huge problem and we have to deal with it. Healthcare. There are estimates that vary widely and actually I have both of them in this. I have one, at, one estimates we only squander $475 billion a year. Only. Right? Half a trillion dollars a year on health care. The other one says, no, no, that's the good news. We actually squander $750 billion a year. When I say squander, for instance, you have somebody who comes into a hospital, they're semi-comatose, uh, they need a CAT scan. What the doctor doesn't know is they had a CAT scan that showed they already had an aneurysm three weeks earlier. They don't know, so they take yet another CAT scan. Another. If you just had any way of sharing competently the medical records and accumulating the knowledge, you would have tremendous advantage. So again, it's to some extent a data issue. And the problem, as I said, you have vast amounts of it, you're just not using it effectively. There's a great quote from Anne Winbold of Humboldt Winbold Ventures, and basically this is our view, which is data is the new oil, right? The raw form, it's useless. Once you refine it, it'll power the world. I mean, this is our view of what we call big data, because you can attack problems like that and make material difference. However, you have to redefine how you handle it. Classically, for all of our history, what we've done is you basically have a CPU, you take data, you drag it to the CPU, you massage it, you throw it away. Over the course of time, data will become the asset, and it'll be in either a petabyte, you know, storage class memory, or some vast, very new high-speed storage device. But the point is, you'll surround it, the memory will be persistent, and you'll just work around the edges. It is an inversion of what we've been doing, again, for the last 40 years, but it is something that if you look at the amount of data we're going to have to handle, 
You can't just drag it to a central location and shove it through a funnel. It's not going to work. To understand and utilize it, though, you do need some tools. And the software, of course, is key to this, and that's the area of analytics. Um, the reason you need analytics is the classic, you know, you have all the data, where's my answer? Um, it's usually, by the way, nowhere near that polite, but I decided to edit it out. Um, it is an enormous problem. So at 2008, Sam Palmazano was then the chairman, said, look, you know, I will fund you guys 100 million bucks because you had all these great ideas what to do for society with information technology, but you damn well got to pay back, which is make a self-sustaining business out of any one of the things you start. You know, I don't just want to throw money at a problem because when you throw money at a problem and you don't come out with a self-sustaining business, guess what? That's it. You throw money at the problem and it's done. If you actually go in and you come and you make a viable business out of it that sustains itself, the value will propagate through society inherently. You won't have to just give money away to make it happen, which, by the way, is a losing proposition. And so we looked at this, and we did a whole bunch of work, and I'm not going to go through all of it. We did smart water management, smarter food, you name it. But one of the things we focused on is smart cities. Now, smart, the reason we did this is grounded in demographics. And there's a piece of demographics that's absolutely astonishing, which is probably the biggest change societally in the history of mankind and went by virtually unnoticed in 2010. Now the question is, if you haven't seen me talk, don't cheat, but if you haven't seen me talk, anybody know what happened in 2010 that is the seminal shift? Yes? A majority of human beings live in cities. Damn. Well done. Big deal. Not widely known. For the first time in the history of mankind, the majority of human beings lived in a city. They did not live in a rural area. Now here's the really sobering part. Go forward 20 years and what you discover is a mere 2 billion people are going to show up in those cities. 2 billion. Just in 20 years, in your lifetimes, believe me. Okay, now there's a sobering thought. You probably want to get cities right. That would be a really good plan, right? So one of the elements we looked at, and I'm just going to, I'm going to give a whole bunch of examples of how this sort of plays together. Smarter cities include transportation. So this is kind of an interesting model. Historically, if you look at transportation, it's been essentially a transactional thing. You get on a bus, you pay your fare, you drive your car across a bridge, you pay for that. That's not really useful. It doesn't teach you anything. But there are cities like Singapore, which if you've been there, that little thing overhead, by the way, is ERP, E-R-P, Electronic Road Pricing, where they can actually manipulate traffic. They can literally change the price what it costs you to enter the city by various gateways, even if it's two streets apart. The other thing is, of course, you have lights and other ways of doing this. You also have ways of finding where every car is all the time, how many cars are at a given location, how fast they're going. That enables you to actually sit down and build a control model, and you can do a predictive model, which is to say, if you measure this enough, and you acquire enough data, I could build a model that tells you that, look, if I see this traffic pattern now, I pretty much guarantee you in the future I'll see this. Now, here's the key. I don't want real-time traffic. You know, I love it. You get on the radio, it says real-time traffic. You know what they're telling you? You're stuck. Fantastic. I know this. The guy in front of me is stationary. I got that worked out. Okay, real-time. That's a real help. Um, I also am not that interested in you will be stuck. Yeah, I know. All three roads going into New York City are jammed, and I got my choice which one I prefer to sit on. Okay, also, not really valuable. Now, if you tell me, oh, by the way, you would have been stuck, but don't worry, I dealt with it. You're my hero. Problem is that not only requires you to know the future, it requires you to change the future, and that is not science fiction. That's what big data is about. What I mean by that is, first of all, can you predict this stuff? How accurately? So this is kind of cool. Um, the nine plots on the left are simply nine different locations in the city of Singapore where we're looking for how many cars go by those spots, right? And there are nine plots, except I just lied to you. There are actually 18 plots. One is blue and one is black. We, blue one is a model that we drew 10 minutes before we measured black. That isn't just pretty good. That's pretty damn amazing. They lay, the prediction and the reality lay over one another, even though we're making the prediction 10 minutes out. And by the way, it doesn't look any different 20 minutes out. Well, that is predicting the future with astounding accuracy. Why? You know, conservation of energy? There's another thing that's at play here, conservation of vehicles. They don't just disappear and fall off the earth. You know, they're, they're going by here, they'll probably end up there. Um, the fact is, on the right, is how fast they're going. 
But that way, I say, wait a minute, I'm predicting 20 minutes in advance there's going to be this tremendous drop in traffic speed because basically there's a pile up of traffic. Why don't I just tinker with the system until my predictor says, no, this is back up here, and that traffic jam or slowdown doesn't happen. Well, that's exactly what we do, and we do it, and it works. This is predicting the future and changing it for the better. That's what big data is about. It's not about telling you, yes, you've dropped a large lead weight on your foot. Okay, your nerves are already telling you that and you know, you're looking for the ice pack. This doesn't help. The real trick to big data is predicting the future and altering it for the better. Now in business, it can give you a benefit on a massive scale. Um, there are a lot of fun things. I'll give you one of the nice examples. So there's a bank in China. Now China is a fascinating place. You know, I, I once visited the head of a big mobile company and he looked somewhat distracted and after we chatted for a few minutes I said, look, if this is a bad time, I'll come back. He said, no, 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 my, my uh, chief information officer was in here. He told me we have a small problem in the city. I said, what's the problem? He says, yeah, next week we'll have six million more subscribers and we're not sure what to do. A different scale of problem, folks. Well, that's not that unusual. I mean, literally, you're dealing with a country that is growing at phenomenal spe uh, speed. It's done incredibly well. And the challenge they face is, what do you do with vast numbers of people? Well, one of the other challenges, okay, you're a bank. The city is going to grow by five miles. What do you do when you add branches? Well, normally you take a grid and you just uniformly space the grid branches as evenly as you could in the new area of the city that's being built. Not optimal. What if you could go back and say, all right, you show up at our China research labs and say, can we do better? So what they do is they say, give me every piece of information you have about all of the branches you launched in the last, let's say, five years. And I'm going to look at the demographics, and I'm going to basically analyze what are the key predictors of performance. I'm then going to do a market potential analysis, again, from the predictors in the area that's being built up. I'm then going to give you clustering of hotspots of opportunity versus those that are, frankly, not hotspots. And then I'm going to basically tell you, here's where you put your branches. And then we're going to run a test because statistically they know to within actually a remarkably accurate level how, money, how much money should have resulted from the deposits. Turns out in this one city they found that the deposit volumes went up by $1.04 billion versus what they expected. We overachieved by over a billion dollars. They were stunned. By the way, we no longer do this in one city. They do this in every city they work in now. The point is that's what analytics does. If you acquire enough data, you can predict traffic, but you can also predict economic outcomes. So another interesting thing, oil fields. We all know BP, hopefully, not too well. Um, Statoil, they have about 40 massive platforms off the coast of Norway, huge place. In the Nordics, uh, they're the biggest player. Well, you have no idea. These guys throw out, believe it or not, a terabyte of data a day from all that operation. They measure everything, which is, by the way, kudos to them. I mean, we're talking every attribute from vibrations in the pump to pressures in the lines, static in the lines, strength of cables, loading on cables, loading on footers, you name it. The thing that they run into is a little problem. It takes 90,000 man hours to do maintenance on one of these platforms when they shut it down for an overhaul. And they do it, roughly speaking, every two years. Not because they have to, but statistically they're told that, well, these pumps might fail, let's say 1% of them every two years, you don't dare let the pump fail or the casing fracture because you'd lose oil. It would, be a, it would be a cataclysmic event. But is there a way you can improve things by actually measuring what's happening and then be able to predict what needed service, what didn't? And if you could do it correctly, what happens is the cost for planned maintenance, of course, over time goes down, right? The less maintenance you do, the less per unit time it costs. The trouble is unplanned maintenance, which is a polite way of saying unmitigated catastrophes, uh, they go up over time. And you want to find that optimal point where the overall value works and you don't have a catastrophe. Well, it turns out that you can do that. And I won't crawl through the detail, but I will tell you the outcome. In this oil field, we got a result that was so astonishing, again, because you do an end-to-end -end analytic run, and then you run the predictive models, and you basically take a failure rate that's in the noise. You don't want any failures. And then you go figure out what you actually must do. You also coordinate activities so that if you have three or four oil wells that share a common feeder, you might as well shut them all down if you're going to shut one of them down because it impacts the others. If you do all those optimizations, we didn't really know how much it would save, so we brought in an independent oil industry analyst. It was not one of ours, not one of theirs. And we agreed, let's see what it saved. Their best estimate is we saved them $10 billion of operating expense a year. A year. 
So in the next five years, they made 50 billion bucks. Man, we did not charge them enough. <laughs> Dumber than a brick, sorry. <clears throat> yeah, time and materials. Yeah, well, we're learning our lessons, by the way. This is not a lesson you want to learn twice because you'll be unemployed. Um, yeah, talk about squandering an opportunity. It actually has a lot of other fun things that go on. For instance, analytics, right? What else can you find? There's all different forms of it. For instance, discovery and mitigation. So there's a company that periodically would have one of their main systems crash. And so we had an analyst look at this. There's something called Granger causality. It's a deep piece of mathematics people use to back out what caused, how, a did, how did A cause B? Or even identify what is A? How did A cause B to crash? It's a complex structure and it turns out what you want to do is red or bad events, blue or changes you made that led to them and the width of the line say, well, this one had a major impact here. This one, you don't have to look at that carefully. What happens is you go through this sort of an analysis and then you scan over time to look for the first evidence of a disaster, the first indicator of a problem. And the problem is Granger causality, in fact, is very difficult to scan across large spans of time. There's a mathematician, Orly Lozano, who works for us, who is extraordinarily skilled. And Orly basically dug into this modified Granger causality. She was able to scan across large periods of time, identify the critical areas. And keep in mind, this is a massive global company where I had to bring her literally. I went down and picked up this huge box of disk drives, terabit disk drives, that she ran into the system, crawled through data that went back years. The net result is she found, yeah, there's this consistent first event that triggered this consistent disaster which they don't call a disaster, they call it an anomaly because if you're in politics and corporations, you don't call things disasters. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm not much of a politician myself. Uh, as a consequence of this, she discovered what actually was causing it, which basically is the equivalent of a system going down somewhere in Europe, dumps its load to two other systems that aren't quite big enough. They eventually dump their loads to two other systems and this cascade wraps around the world and lands in New York, where if you watch this poor system in New York over the course of 65 minutes, the utilization of the memory goes up and up and up and up until finally the memory saturates and you start paging the system and then you're done. So here's the catch, 65 minutes. Keep in mind, people normally think of failures in IT systems in nanosec. I mean, what are you kidding? It took 65 minutes for that cascade, which is why after years they never found it. Okay, so that's one thing. But healthcare is another kind of place that life is interesting if you actually use data. It is, uh, it's a great quote, right? It's dying of thirst in an ocean of data. Um, we once actually were upset. Our first attempts to use our Watson analytics uh, capabilities to solve, uh, basically do diagnostics. We only were hitting the numbers maybe 30 to 50%. We went to one of the physicians and said, God, that's depressing. He looked at us and said, you're kidding? You're better than I am. And I didn't go to the doctor again. Um, it turns out that again, there's some very interesting things you can do with big data here, and I'm going to show you just one more instance. You've seen Watson, the Jeopardy playing Q&A system, right? But it has a deep analytic engine buried within it. The question is, if you applied it to medicine, what does it do, or how will it work? And we're doing this, by the way, in cancer with MD Anderson, with uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. This is in actually commercial use by WellPoint. I mean, we're actually well down the road here. Well, let's say somebody presents with a bunch of symptoms, right? A woman complains of dizziness, inability to eat, dry mouth, increased thirst, frequent urination, also had a fever, no back pain, no abdomen, abdominal pain, no cough. So positive symptoms, negative symptoms. Okay. Well, first of all, you've got to extract the symptoms from a record. A machine can do that. And then what it does is it mines the paraphrasings and alternate phrasings. Just make sure that it interpreted her report of symptoms as closely as possible. And then it goes and looks at some diagnostic models associated with those problems. And you know, you come up with a bunch of symptoms and a preliminary diagnosis. However, remember those are the positive symptoms. You also have lacking symptoms that are not there. And because symptoms are missing, the diagnosis changes. Okay, well, maybe it's diabetes. Then if you go ahead and you go to the next level, you say, all right, can you explain away certain things, basically looking at data that you've Im uh, embedded within Watson. Now, I should explain Watson's not a search engine. What Watson is designed to do is literally strip data and put it into a format that can extract at high speed. And what it does essentially is you input a statement, it breaks it up into a huge number of hypothetical answers, but then grades those answers against its database and comes up with a probability, a probabilistic approach to what the answer is. So you continue that process and you look at the family history of the patient. You say, wait a minute. There's a history of bladder cancer, but also Graves' disease. 
Well, that biases it back towards perhaps diabetes. But of course, patient has a history. Well, the patient actually has a history associated with uh, frequent urinary tract infections. So the bias, again, goes the other way, but there are a lot more complexities still. Medication can bias how the symptoms present themselves. You have to allow for that. And it turns out that esophagitis actually comes up as one of the potential causes, uh, one of the potential results. And in fact, that was never even on the list. But by looking at the medications being taken, it could have been masked by the medicine, OK? But at this point, you have this chart, and you're looking and saying, you know, I can test for any one of these things because there are standard tests. And Watson will spit out and say, hey, look, the standard tests, very easy test, by the way, a dipstick that basically looks for blood in the urine, looks for E. coli. I mean, a very straightforward set of tests. And so you get your findings. And you take those findings, and you realize, wait a minute, there is, in fact, E. coli there. And the probability of urinary tract infection becomes dramatically higher than, in fact, diabetes. And you now treat the person. This takes all of about three seconds. It took me way longer to walk you through it than if presented with this, it'll take about three seconds to get down to the point, just by looking at the medical record, that you're short of findings. You go through the tests, you go back, it takes another maybe one second to get, once you have the findings, you know the answer. It doesn't displace the physician. The physician interfaces to the client. Many people will not be straight with you about what they're suffering from. You have to observe them. But the fact of the matter is, it is enormous help, an enormous help. Innovation really has taken on almost a new meaning because now the innovators have to be much, much more broad. That T-shaped person I showed you at the beginning is ever more critical because the problems we're dealing with are systems of systems. I don't care how good you are, you can't know everything. You know, IBM is, is actually very good at beating this out of people because you have to understand um, you're not hanging out with an average bunch. My, my own, uh, so we say, epiphany on, on how limited it, uh, how should I put this? It, my own experience with having my egos flattened summarily was sitting at a dinner once with uh, four of my colleagues. I told uh, Dina Tino this earlier, where I'm sitting at the table and about two pints of beer in in Hursley, England. I look around and I said to my buddies, I said, guys, I, I don't think I really fit in here. I ought to take a hike. And they just looked at each other because we've known each other about two decades. They said, you know, too much beer? I said, no, dummies. I'm the only guy at the table who doesn't have a Nobel Prize. That, that pretty much takes care of your ego. Um, my point is, let me tell you, work with your colleagues. By yourself, you, will, you, you wouldn't believe how much value. You can even talk to one of your lawyers. You'd be amazed. They can even contribute. That's an epiphany right there. Uh, by the way, I'm not laughing. <laughs> if you're into this business, IP, really big thing. Analytics, however, and this is the thing, this is about extracting insights and then proactively changing the future for the better. This is a big damn deal. And this will become as common a part of your toolkit as a pocket calculator was 25, 30 years ago. It will literally become standard issue. It needs to. This is something we know how to do. We know what the impact is. We know it has incredible value. But it isn't getting the attention yet it needs. I admire what's happening here. The reason I'm here, frankly, is Northwestern has a very, very excellent program focused around data analytics and the utilization thereof. I, there's no question. But the point is, it's unusual, which is unfortunate. Because we're still teaching classical statistical methods. And yes, I know, you know, Six Sigma and all that good stuff. But that didn't exactly work out for us. You know? The fact of the matter is, there's a lot of work still to be done here. The last thing, though, and this is something I torture my colleagues with in other companies, is we shouldn't be the only guys. And we're no longer. There are people who talk about you know, the connected world. And I don't care. You know, I would much rather have 47 uh, competitors who all decide that they want to kick in and use information technology for betterment. I mean, you have the ability to solve some unimaginably intractable problems if you're willing to spend the money and the time. Mostly, the talent. It is your talent that is your real asset, right? It's, it's, this is kind of like uh, looking for a house, right? Location, location, location. Well, it's actually people, people, people. But it is a responsibility of the industry. And we take it very seriously. And, and I'm delighted to say I'm noticing that a couple of other companies have really stepped up and said, yeah, you know, we should kick in. We're, we're not going to be the guys carrying the ball by ourselves, not for long. But it, it's an opportunity you guys have. What you do is not irrelevant. I mean, engineering, science, mathematics, STEM, this is an area that has an ability to change the world much more dramatically, frankly, than LIPS. Um, my standard line, by the way, if any, anybody know who LIPS is, please, God, tell me. Somebody here knows Mick Jagger's nickname? 
Oh, God, I'm old. <laughs> Moving right along, uh, the fact of the matter is that you know, the scientists and the engineers who solve these problems are the rock stars. They are. I mean, this is heavy lifting. This is not light duty stuff. Um, I actually have been known to somewhat irritate places like entire governments of nations by telling them that you really need to kind of recognize these guys as the rock stars. When I was a kid and I watched, you know, sending a man to the moon, the guys who did that were the rock stars. And they really were the rock stars. I mean, they were the heroes and they, they did amazing things for society. And, you know, we, we somehow lost that focus. It's not necessarily about earning the most money in the shortest period of time. But it shouldn't also be about just making ends meet because you're in a field that has tremendous societal value, but society doesn't value it tremendously. So there is fortunately a move back to really focusing on that. I mean, STEM has become a real catchphrase again, thankfully. But we went through a hell of a valley before we got there. So in any case, thank you very much for this opportunity. This is always fun to actually get out and look at people who do real work. And you know, I hope you continue to do so.